Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, and I'm going to present on Riddle Me of This, which is a terrible pun that will make sense in a moment. Um, and this is a project we did this last year uh, with the Minneapolis Institute of Art. So basic themes, I kind of divide it into two different sections. Um, one is how do you develop an immersive sort of gamified uh, museum visitor experience? And second, how do you do this with a big cultural institution that has lots of moving parts? Um, so basically, I'm just going to talk about some of the project background, the challenges we had to overcome, uh, how we implemented this app, and finally sort of wrapping up what lessons we learned. Um, so a bit of background. Uh, so my name is Samantha Porter. I am an archaeologist by training. Um, and my colleague down there, kind of blurry, that's Colin McFadden. Um, he's a programmer by trade, but sometimes he dresses up like an archaeologist when he goes on vacation. Um, and we work in this space called ASOS, or the Advanced Imaging Service for Objects and Spaces. And we're sort of a hub um, on the University of Minnesota campus for different types of 3D scanning. Um, we do RTI, we have a scanning electron microscope. Um, and the idea is by being a hub on campus, other departments don't have to also repeat that sort of infrastructure. Um, and when you end up with a lot of 3D models, you start wondering, well, what else can I do with that? Um, and so we started to get in with the anthropology faculty uh, experimenting with some sorts of immersive experiences. Um, and so we, then we got this email, uh, just because they send these out to everyone, um, with the Minneapolis Institute of Art, which now is rebranded to MIA, hence the terrible pun in our uh, project name, uh, was looking for, and this is a very general call, inventions from those working in the field of technology and art to augment and personalize visitor experience. Um, so this was award sponsored by 3M, they're the people who make Scotch tape. Um, and this was the third year of the award. So then I got this other email in my inbox from Colin being like, what if we made an augmented reality escape room game in the museum? And just some more general background, the Minneapolis Institute of Art is kind of like the premier fine art museum in Minneapolis. Um, it's been around for, I think, since about the 1920s. Um, and it has stuff going back presumably to the Paleolithic, though it might be fake, um, all the way to contemporary artists. Uh, and it really prides itself on being open to the community. It's a free museum. Most of their programming is free. Um, and they have everything from art classes to parties with DJs um, that are open. Uh, and then who here has done an escape room or a puzzle room? All right, that's like a decent amount of the audience. Um, so basically, puzzle rooms are immersive experiences. Um, I was on a panel uh, on these somehow with industry folks at Startup Week um, in Minneapolis, and they were talking about how there's like virtual reality, and there's mixed reality, and there's augmented reality, and then there's real reality, which is what escape rooms usually are. They're physical spaces that are themed. Um, so this is photos of myself and Colin with different groups, and this was a not Harry Potter because of copyright, but really Harry Potter themed escape room where you're in uh, the headmaster's office and you have to solve a bunch of puzzles to find the elder wand. Um, so mu museums are great, right? Because they're already immersive, um, right? You have this whole world uh, to play with. Um, and we did come up with this independently, but it turns out a lot of other people have had this idea as well. I really like this other conference presentation about attracting millennials. Um, to your museum, uh, but what sort of these projects have is that they are, you know, physical in a lot of ways, either through a giant installation, um, maybe they have lots of staff, etc. And what we wanted to do was have it open to players where they could show up whenever they wanted, get that app, and then go um, do that experience. So not limiting folks to time slots or group sizes or anything like that. So we threw together this really, really cheesy pitch with some really bad Photoshop, um, but it actually worked and we got it. Um, so, oh my gosh, now what? We've got eight months to make this app. Um, so first of all, our team. So from the University of Minnesota, it was myself and Colin McFadden. Uh, from Mia, we principally worked with Gretchen Halverson, who is their digital program coordinator. She was our main contact, for example, with the curators um, and other moving parts in the museum. Douglas Hedgley, who's their chief digital officer who works on strategy. Um, and then since we actually had money, we were actually able to hire some developers. Um, so Glitch is a nonprofit in Minneapolis that came out of the University of Minnesota student group. Uh, and their whole reason for being uh, is to support emerging game makers in the Twin Cities and particularly those um, folks that are coming from more diverse backgrounds. So we worked with Ava, who's their managing director, uh, and then 
Through them, we were able to hire Charles McGregor uh, as our main developer, who was a recent U of M graduate. Um, so this was kind of going in, how do we balance these ideas of fun and learning? Uh, so you can read this really long comic, basically no one likes having to just repeat facts out, right? This is supposed to be a game uh, above all else. So kind of the strategy we took was, if you're using this information in a fun way, you're actually gonna pick it up and retain it more than if we're just asking you what year some work of art. Um, was created. So that was kind of our ethos going in. We're going to make a fun puzzle experience above all. And if people happen to remember and pick things up, that's sort of a bonus. So in terms of proving the concepts, mostly this initially involved us walking around the museum looking for inspiration, looking for uh, works of art we wanted to feature, etc. Um, we started off with sort of paper prototypes, writing out puzzles and like holding them up to our friends and family. Um, and then as this evolved, we had an event. Uh, so as I mentioned, they have like cool events with DJs. Um, and that's sort of this third Thursday of the month series. So they had a nerd themed night. Um, so to test our puzzle concepts, we kind of just threw in um, a web-based uh, puzzle experience. We had like an automatic evil society generator. So in this case, it's the community of Rococo particle physicists. And there's an evil plot. Uh, and you have to go and foil them by solving these puzzles. So some challenges. Uh, navigation was a, probably our principal challenge. Um, basically, the museum is a series of white rooms that look slightly different if you use different white balance settings. Uh, the maps are extremely confusing, especially if you're in the interior of the museum and you can't orient yourself. Walking around is just really hard. Um, and we got feedback during our testing that a map is not fun. This is not fun. So how do we get people to navigate through the space in an interesting way? Um, this is compounded by poor signage. So the gallery numbers are these tiny little plaques that are sometimes on the thresholds of doors. Um, sometimes you have spaces labeled, sometimes you don't. Sometimes this is temporary signage, for example, with this hard bodies exhibit. Um, and then, of course, the museum is always in flux. Pieces are always moving. And you don't necessarily realize this just as a visitor who's coming every six months. So we asked, oh, what are safe pieces? We want our game to have a life of at least six months, if not a year, etc. And then they gave us this extremely confusing Excel document. Um, so just some examples of that space being in flux. These are two of the signature pieces of the museum. Um, it's a Greek statue of Doriferous and uh, Jade Mountain, which is about like this big jade statue. Both of these pieces had been in the same place for decades. And then there were some temporary exhibits and both of them got moods. Um, we also avoided prints and photographs because those tend to be on display uh, shorter periods of time. And this is my favorite. This is an Otis elevator that had been there since the 1930s that we were using as a waypoint. And halfway through development, we walked by and they were putting drywall over it. So that was a no also. Um, so we really were trying to, for navigation, find landmarks that were kind of locked in to the space, whether it's uh, architectural or things like windows. Um, and I mentioned that elevator, another big consideration was movement and accessibility. We wanted folks to get through a decent amount of the museum. Um, and so that X represents uh, where that third elevator was supposed to be. So we had two remaining elevators left, which really, for accessibility reasons, because we wanted to keep groups together, sort of locked us in to when we changed museum floors uh, using very specific waypoints. Um, then just some other general logistics. We were like, oh, do you have a nice database of all these didactics? And they're like, no, it's in like 7,000 different Word documents. So if we wanted to reference didactics, we had to physically walk around the museum and take photos of those. Um, again, construction is happening, exhibits are changing, so we had to worry about that. How are people getting through the space? Um, dealing with security, telling them there's gonna be people maybe doing kind of weird seemingly things. Don't worry about it. Um, we had some installed pieces like this key, and then it's really small, but a uh, little vinyl sticker. Um, and that got removed three times by security, even though the museum staff were the ones um, putting it up. Um, as well as just dealing with things like staff time for training that had to be part of the budget um, of the project. So story and audience was probably another one of the most difficult things to deal with right away. Um, Minneapolis is an extremely diverse city, well, maybe I'll say for the US, 
um, right? You have Euro, Euro American populations, indigenous populations, and a significant amount of um, immigrant and refugee uh, populations as well. So we want to really make sure that the story we were telling was something that could be, you know, interesting and respectful, of course, to all of those groups. Um, some escape room tro tropes include themes of art heists and ancient aliens. Mm -hmm. So those were definitely a no. Um, so after thinking about that, we sort of played on what our app was about, which was using technology to connect with art. Um, so we were like, let's make that the case uh, for this. So we came up with an evil secret society called Nella Vectis, which is really bad translated like Google Latin for no bars. Um, and their argument was that right, technology has severed our connection with art. Um, and we've planted a device in the museum that will make everyone's cell phones go wonky unless you find it. Um, but they've left a series of clues in case like-minded individuals would like to join their organization. So you're going to follow these series of clues. And then at the end, you can either join them or you can destroy the disruption advice, device and save everyone's uh, electronics. So in terms of the nitty gritty of creating the app, uh, we used Unity. Basically, um, I won't go into too much detail, but Charles uh, sort of created these prefabs where we could input um, who was sending you the message, whether it's the director of the museum or if it's Nello Vectis, um, and adding other puzzle bits in there. Um, and for the augmented reality portion, we used Euphoria, which is pretty easy. Um, it cost us a little bit of money, I think $500 for our level of project. Um, but it's basically you can upload your trackers and you can upload those AR overlays. With no Unity experience, I followed a YouTube tutorial and was able to figure this out in like two hours. So it was relatively straightforward. Um, and then we had three different types of puzzles. So the first one was an augmented reality trigger. You show something to your AR camera and triggers the next message to arrive. Um, so in this case, it's a visitor badge. The first thing you do when uh, you enter the museum is you're told to go to the welcome desk and get a badge. Uh, and that also is an excuse to have a physical interaction, a real personal interaction with museum staff. And then also that gave them a chance if there was something weird in the museum that was breaking the game to actually tell you. Um, next, we had sort of uh, puzzles where you could fill in character strings uh, and finally pressing buttons in the messaging system. Um, so I'm just going to really quickly walk through an example puzzle. Um, normally, I don't do this if I'm presenting in Minnesota, but since you have to be at the museum to play the game, hopefully this is safe. Um, so here you get, uh, we had to change the name of the curator because the curator also left um, for the National Portrait Gallery. The gallery. Um, but here you're trying to piece together some clues. And then if you look at that message, you have in red underlined that's where you should go. So gallery G200. And then we're also telling you how to get there. So it's on the second floor near the windows facing the park. Take the stairs or elevator up one level. Uh, and then in blue underlined, we have this clue. Uh, the universe leaves us hints. We just need to read the signs that's telling you to look at the didactics. Uh, and basking in humility is the path to disruption. And then there's a series of characters, um, which you, if you can actually read these, some of them are just flipped, mirrored, etc. So you have to find the ones that are actually real. So here's Gallery G200, you go up the stairs, you start walking around, you're looking at these Buddha statues, you're looking at the didactics, and then maybe you'll notice this uh, humility brings prosperity gate. Okay, we found humility, um, but if you look, does this work? Right, over there, um, you can see those are actually modern Chinese characters, so they don't actually match. So people kind of get confused what's going on, you actually have to walk inside the gate to see these characters. Um, and from there, you select the characters that are present on that work of art. If it's correct, then you will get your next message to send you to the next puzzle. Um, we also wanted to include a hint system um, because we don't have like a game master like other escape rooms do. Uh, we didn't want anyone to feel like they were stuck. So we had three levels of hints, and this is kind of based off of card games uh, that simulate an escape room experience. So um, exit and unlock are the two principal ones there. Um, so the first level clue will tell you this is what you need to do and where. The second level will give you sort of a more detailed clue, like what you might want to do, kind of hinting you a bit more in the right direction. And then the third level is actually just telling you the solution. Um, and that ensures no one gets stuck. Um, we also purposefully did not include a timer because we didn't want people to feel stressed. And we didn't want people physically running through the halls of the museum. Um, and then we add some extras, there's a map there if you want, of course credits, a list of galleries visited, uh, and then we threw in sort of this 
selfie feature, which will auto post to social media with some hashtags. And that's uh, my cat Zoe that we were testing this out on. Um, so we launched the app in September and we're like, it's free, it's fun, there's culture. Uh, we were on both uh, Apple and Android because we wanted people, regardless of their device, to be able to do this. Um, and we also had devices that could be borrowed in the museum, either if you didn't have a phone, you didn't want to download it, or a lot of people were just like, my battery is dying, like, can I, can I borrow one? So um, then uh, the museum has a really good PR department, which was frightening because I'm not used to that, and neither was Colin, um, but we managed to get on the local radio as well as the local news, so we were able to get a decent amount of publicity, um, which drew people in. We also managed to get a bit of traction on social media, so that's actually on um, the left, the reporter who was interviewing us for the previous story, and he brought his wife back because he thought it'd be fun to do. Um, and then we had some nice articles where, which were really exciting to read um, because it seemed like what we wanted was actually the experience um, people seemed to get. So sort of these quotes, like you've actually got to like examine the art when you go to a museum, duh. But you know, I think a lot of times people go, you're on an awkward like maybe first date and you're like, yeah, art, yeah. And you know, it doesn't actually, um, you don't feel as engaged. Um, so since September, um, we've had approximately 4,600 downloads of the app um, and approximately 2,400 full playthroughs. Um, the actual number of people playing probably as much higher than that um, because groups of people will share a device and that's also not counting uh, the loaner devices. So on average, it takes about 50 to 60 minutes to finish the game, uh, which was kind of around what we were aiming for. That's how much sort of a normal escape room takes. So in terms of what worked, um, I think player freedom worked really well. You could vary your group size when you started, how hard or you know could you get clues? Um, and also this was an interesting point, freedom not to see the whole museum. So we were uh, specifically targeting this at a group of folks um, called like experience seekers, people who want to go to these cultural institutions for a specific experience versus sort of wandering around. And so this was a specific experience and you don't have to be intimidated by this giant space. You can go there and do this one thing. Um, and then I think we were also pretty successful in sort of balancing those fun and learning aspects. Um, and also we're successful in getting people to see works of art and parts of the museum they may not have visited otherwise. Um, so a few improvements. Uh, as I said, the goal with this was sort of just to see the museum. Um, so potentially going forward, we could develop versions of this with specific learning outcomes or storylines. Uh, currently, right, there's only one set of puzzles, so there's no replay value. We would love to develop more of this, but it takes quite a bit of time. Um, handling super large groups can be difficult, especially when there's big events. Groups sort of stack up on each other, um, and sometimes it's fun because they actually start interacting with strangers, trying to solve these puzzles, but sometimes that frustrates people. Um, and then finally, also, we'd like to uh, put this out in different languages. As I said, it's a very diverse city, um, but currently we are only in English, um, and that was just sort of a time constraint issue. Um, future directions. So we do have our Unity uh, stuff available on GitHub at that link. Um, we would like also, you know, to create curricular tie-ins for specific, you know, maybe middle high school um, groups. Expanding to more institutions, of course, that would be very exciting. Um, but right, this was sort of a job we did as part of our side, like a side gig to our main job. Um, so that would sort of, we definitely want to find uh, collaborators to work with. Um, and then the pie in the sky future direction would actually be to get a much larger grant to create a sort of whizzy way of what you see is what you get drag and drop thing because you know some institutions have developers that know how to put a thing on the app store that know how to use unity and work with c sharp but most places don't um, and so that's still a limiting factor for lots of folks so just to sum up lessons learned um, people learn things even if you're not teaching or feeding information to them i think this crowd probably gets that um, and that gamification can be an effective way to get people to engage uh, with these types of institutions. Um, also, technology is often not the greatest hurdle. It was a bit of a hurdle because we didn't have a ton of experience with these things, but at the same time, actually developing those puzzles and that storyline was much, uh, took much more of our time. Um, and finally, AR and VR are great, but people still like real reality. They like tactile things. Um, during testing, one user said they really liked seeing the nooks and crannies of the museum. Um, so that kind of this idea that we can use these immersive technologies as a tool to help people experience different things.
Um, so thanks 